Okay, welcome to this lecture video uh, series. Today we're going to deal with enteric fever, uh, which is part of the fecal oral diseases that we are doing under the infectious and vector-borne diseases uh, series that we are having. Okay, so to start us off, uh, just remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel to actually see our other videos. Now, so we're going to start with uh, looking at salmonella, which is the, basically the organism that is responsible for the entire enteric fevers that we'll be looking at. So to basically look at the bacteriology of um, the entire uh, organism that salmonella as a group is a very complex one and it has over 2000 species. However, there are those that are pathogenic to man and they are of the serotype uh, salmonella enterica. So most of the things that it causes to human beings are things like uh, the much known typhoid fever, gastroenteritis, septicemia, uh, and um, it can also be in a carrier state which can be transmitted to other people. Okay, so enteric fever can be caused by the following agents. We can have salmonella typhi, which is responsible for the um, uh, for the disease typhoid disease and then we have uh, salmonella paratyphi a b and c which is also re re responsible for uh, paratyphoid fever okay so the features of this uh, bacteria that i uh, is in this uh, class of salmonella includes that um, they are gram negative again okay we said most of these um, enterobacteriaceae are gram negative and then it's non-spore forming and it's a facultative anaerobe. Uh, it is in the family of Enterobacteriaceae, okay, normally found in the enteric uh, system or basically the gastrointestinal system. And the species uh, uh, of the Salmonella enterica. Okay, so it's also important that at this moment actually we, we, we separate that the, the disease that is called the typhoid fever and this is because of how it presented clinically earlier on and it resembled the typhus fever so remember the typhus fever it's totally different from the typhoid fever so just to look at the pattern of transmission um, and distribution of uh, this disease is that the the the, the known hosts is the human beings and we don't have any other known known uh, host so this one disease that if we decide to eradicate would be uh, quite straightforward because we are the uh, only known host for, for, for the bacteria. So um, the food, and uh, it, it's a food and waterborne uh, disease that uh, results from uh, fecal contamination. Okay, and uh, this bacteria is actually carried from contaminated food and contaminated water, okay? And also, apart from that, it can also be co uh, carried by uh, asymptomatic carriers. Uh, it can also be transmitted sexually between male partners and uh, also healthcare workers who are exposed to infected specimens. But the most common way of community transmission is through food and water that is contaminated. Uh, this is just a picture to show the distribution. As you can see, the, the, the parts in yellow are the ones that are very low distribution. Those are the um, North America areas, part of Europe, mostly part of Europe. Okay. And then you can see the Americas, the low, the South America, Africa, those are the areas with medium level, and also some countries within Africa having high levels of uh, typhoid. But uh, the lower parts of Asia, including India, has a, a very high um, load of this disease. Now to look at the transmission, as I said, it is through mostly the mode of transmission is through contaminated food uh, or, or water. And we have to, we know that the humans are the hosts for this uh, bacteria. So persons with the typhoid fever, they carry it uh, in their bloodstream, the bacteria, and also in their intestinal tract. Um, in addition, there are a small number of people who are just carriers and they recover from it, but still they share the bacteria. 
So both in persons and also the carrier, they shared the salmonella typhi in their stool. So these are other people now get infected when they come into contact with this food, uh, with uh, uh, this tool, either through food that is contaminated with it or water. So the risk factors for this transmission is obviously contaminated water, contaminated food, uh, raw fruit and vegetables that have actually they use fertilizer with directly from sewage that is untreated, uh, lack of hand washing and toilet access, and also. Evidence of prior Helicobacter pylori infection has also been shown to be a risk factor. Okay, so how exactly does it cause disease? The pathophysiology is quite straightforward, is that the bacilli first of all get ingested of it, we take it orally, and then it goes to the intestines, okay, to the gastrointestinal system, and attaches to the microvilli, or basically the mucosa of the, of the small intestines, and then it penetrates the mucosa. Now, once it uh, it penetrates the mucosa, remember it's a bacteria. It we will have uh, the first respondents that, that that's uh, the phagocytes will come and try to phagocytize the the bacteria. Uh, through the the entire process of trying to penetrate the mucus, some of it enters the mesenteric uh, lymph nodes, which ultimately end up in the pus patches. So the pus patches is is a group of lymph nodes that are found in the mesentery. So they can also enter the thoracic duct, okay, and then to the bloodstream. And this is where now the problem comes in is because once this bacteria um, spills uh, into the blood, that is when now we have a problem and we have some sort of bacteremia, uh, septicemia. So this now spreads to the liver, gut, bladder, spleen, bone marrow, lymph nodes, and other parts. Okay, so the, the spilling of the of the bacteria into the bloodstream is what causes the clinical signs and symptoms. So through this, the, um, we'll have a lot of multiplication in these other organs that it has gone, uh, including the gut bladder, uh, the bile rich uh, source of, uh, the bile that is in the gut bladder is a very rich source of uh, the bacteria. So this spilling into the intestines and then affecting the patches, it causes this uh, sort of destruction and then leading to inflammation. And then that part undergoes necrosis. So that necrosis that has, uh, occurs um, leads to what we call the typhoid ulcers. And um, these ulcers can lead to perforation. The perforations now lead to the hemorrhage of the intestines, okay? So this process doesn't happen very fast. It's a very gradual uh, process that will take a couple of uh, weeks. Okay. So this is just a image to show us what we're talking about. You take it orally, you penetrate the epithelial uh, cell, and then multiply it um, interluminally, uh, then continues in the reticular endothelial system, and then in the mesentery, Okay, causing it to be um, necrotic, and then you have damage and perforation, and then re enters again the bowel, and then the same, uh, uh, the same activity again uh, continues. Uh, this section is when now it penetrates and gets into the blood uh, vessel, and you have other clinical signs and symptoms. So, this image now here, you can see the past patches actually uh, being destroyed okay or being affected so from that pathophysiology then we can actually basically know what will, uh, happens in terms of the clinical manifestation we'll have headache malaise basically these are systemic signs uh following the, the spilling over of the bacteria from the uh, luminal area the intraluminal area or basically inside the the lumen of the uh, intestines and then spilling over to the blood supply. So we'll have headaches, okay, we will have also fever, but more importantly the fever for uh, typhoid is characteristic and it has a step ladder type of fever, as you can see. So it keeps rising gradually like a stepwise. And then normally the fever is related to bradycardia, you'll have bradycardia with the fever. And then we obviously have abdominal discomfort, and this is obviously because of the perforation and 
uh, alteration that is found now on the intestines. Constipation, diarrhea, okay, uh, those are gastrointestinal um, system effects that we'll have. Uh, then a palpable spleen, because now the spleen is actually now overworking and then it becomes enlarged. You'll also have a hepatomegaly. Um, and then characteristic spots, which are, uh, are referred to as raw spots. So this is what we call the raw spots. And once these are seen, it is a characteristic of um, typhoid. So the complications that are normally there and the most common, as you can see from these images, you can see perforation of the intestines. So um, intestinal perforation, then that leads to hemorrhage, that is gast uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. So this tool will mostly come out with um, blood in it. Then because of the um, sepsis in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the blood, then we'll, we might have circulatory collapse, uh, leading to things like shock. Ultimately, we can have, because of the spreading of the spilling over of the bacteria into the blood supply and then going to the organs, we can have bronchitis, bronchopneumonia if it goes to the lungs, meningitis if it goes to the brain, polycystitis, arthritis, peritonitis, nephritis, or can even have osteomyelitis, depending on which part of uh, the body it has actually gone to. So one thing that is very common in typhoid fever is the relapses. And normally, apparently, almost 10% of the cases relapse and it's common but the people who have typhoid fever you'll hear them complaining that they have had the symptoms again okay uh, so uh, but however the relapses are usually shorter and milder and uh, but the problem is if you have continuous relapses it's basically like having a chronic sort of typhoid then that will lead to obviously perforation of the intestines we talked about uh, having carriers and that's common so we uh, we basically know around 60 million get uh, the typhoid fever worldwide every year but uh, and it kills around 500,000 of us so one in 30 of these survivors become carriers so you can imagine that's a very big number of people who actually become uh, carriers of 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 um, this bacteria and one of the most common carriers Actually, the first case to, to be able to, to uh, that was actually described to be a carrier of typhoid was uh, Mary Malone, okay, who actually was a cook and then was able to spread the bacteria to wh 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 where she was working and causing people to be sick. But she didn't believe that since herself she could not portray those signs and symptoms, but um, the, the people she was working for were becoming sick. Okay, so for diagnosis of um, typhoid and paratyphoid, paratyphoid is that um, blood, um, uh, taking blood samples and actually examining them, uh, bone marrow, stool culture, and vital tests are some of the diagnostic tests that can be used. However, in our African setting, the vital tests in most de um, developing countries, the vital test is still being used. However, in the developed countries, the vital test is no longer being used because of its lack of uh, sensitivity. So the vital test is basically a serological test and based on the principle of agglutination of the antibodies with the antigen. So what is provided is the, um, um, the antibodies arise at the end of the first week. If you have, for example, the disease, okay, so they will provide the antigens and then um, they take the blood sample. If you had had the infection, obviously you would have the antibodies. Now the antibodies will react with the antigen agglutinating and that agglutination will be, will be deemed to be positive vital test showing that you actually had a typhoid uh, fever. However, um, this takes long because we know for the antibodies to be generated, uh, they will take long. So you might, if you go to the, the, to the, for the test in the very first few weeks, then um, that might not be seen because um, the antibodies have not yet been developed. Okay, so we don't have enough of them to actually carry out the test. So there are also other tendencies of having a false positive and false negative. Okay, so the sensitivity uh, or, and the specificity of the test is not uh, good. 
So Vidal is, um, as I said, it's not used in other nations, but it is still um, um, being used in developed countries. Uh, so we have treatment. Uh, the treatment for uh, typhoid is actually very cheap and simple. Um, and most of the enteric people are just treated by anti antibiotics and antipyretics at home. Okay, but if somebody has persistent vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal distension, they might have other supportive therapies depending on the signs and symptoms. So if they're having diarrhea uh, and vomiting, then we we'll need to rehydrate them. We we'll need to give um, um, some uh, antipyretics for the for the fever, okay, analgesics for the for the pain, okay. Uh, so the antibiotic of choice is um, ciprofloxacin. Uh, it's one of the um, the drugs that are used. Okay, so ciprofloxacin is um, the drug of choice. It's a quinolone. Uh, however, ceftriaxone, azithromycin can still be used. Ceftriaxone also is used, and um, um, those are the drugs that mostly are used. But ciprofloxacin. Or other quinolones, the drugs of choice, normally given for a period between seven to uh, five to seven days. Okay. Uh, so these are the drugs that we've talked about. For prevention and control, there we have um, the simple things like avoiding drinking and treated water, obviously, usage of uh, toilets, proper hand washing, proper sewage disposal, and warming the food. Okay. Um, uh, the, the, the salmonella tends to be killed by high uh, high temperatures. So actually warming the food or actually cooking them until they are hot, then that can be used also to prevent infection and transmission. And also we have typhoid fever uh, vaccine that are there, uh, both for injection and uh, we also have the oral type of um, vaccine. So these are some of the methods that we use for prevention and control. So thank you very much. I hope you have actually benefited uh, from that uh, presentation. Thank